Don't want to go by the devil. Don't want to go by demon. Don't want to go by Satan. Don't want to die uneasy. Just let me go naturally. naturally. And when I die, and when I'm dead, dead. Miss Andrea Gerbach. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despise you. I start with a disclaimer, as is the way of my profession. I'm not a big fan of these exhortations from Christ's Sermon on the Mount. Not because I don't think they embody some exemplary aspirations, but because I believe they urge the pushing away, the denial, the repression of legitimate emotions and the downgrading of appropriate reactions to injustice. I grew up in a country where to love my enemy, the state and its foot soldiers of apartheid ideology, was an indefensible plea. To do good to those who hated the majority of South Africans and whose hatred was based entirely on the colour of their skin. To bless those who, by judging the other as inferior, sought to inflate their insecure claim to illegitimate power, seemed entirely absurd. My only prayer for those who despised and cursed my fellow countrymen and women was that this white, insular, God-fearing minority might somehow experience the harm, the indignity, the cruel and inhumane treatment that they felt entitled to inflict on black South Africans and on those who opposed their brutal rule. When I witnessed the beating of women with babes on their backs by bully boys sneering thugs in blue, women desperate to be with their husbands in cities and suburbs closed to their shelter, when I encountered the bursting discharge of rabid dogs and lethal gas on peaceful gatherings of picketers and protesters, the dragging of student activists by their tearing hair, the locked away bruised children in detention who had dared to fling stones at armoured tanks and yellow caspers, the firing of bullets into the backs of fleeing workers striking for living conditions and decent pay. When I heard a judge one Friday morning, in less than 15 minutes, sentence 14 of my clients to death, to love my enemy was inconceivable. Rather, as Prospero acknowledged, my rarer action was in virtue than in vengeance. And in vengeance there is virtue. To have no idea of what it means to be treated unjustly is to have no moral knowledge, no moral life. In responding to evil, vengeance, like forgiveness, has a valid and valuable purpose. Vengeance can awaken us to the reach of injustice. It can sharpen and direct our pain and our anger. It can offer a clarity to the chaos that comes with loss. It can reclaim a sense of self-respect and stand as emotional testimony to our enduring struggle that we care about ourselves and our rights and the rights of others. Importantly, vengeance rises to defend an allegiance and an obligation to a moral order, to motivate the righting of a wrong. We all, writes American legal philosopher Jeffrey Murphy, have a duty to 
support, both intellectually and emotionally, the moral order, an order represented by clear understandings of what constitutes unacceptable treatment of one human being by another. If we do not show some resentment to those who, in victimizing us, flout those understandings, then we run the risk of being complicitous in evil. And if we deny the voice of vengeance and the time it takes to shape its decision, if we ignore its guiding nudges in our haste to grasp forgiveness, if we abandon vengeance so that it remains unrealized, its gnawing, burning light rests under the surface and we risk that we drive it underground only to surface as a dark, harbored bitterness at a time when least expected and in a form perhaps akin to that which triggered its initial flicker. How those who survive violence understand and remember what happened can have real consequences for the chances of its renewal. And those consequences are equally perilous when they lead to vengeance and when it is expected that they will lead to saintly forgiveness. Repressed resentment, like forced forgiveness, precipitates a kind of wild justice, impetuous, misguided, masked, and often futile. When vengeance crosses the line, when its stirrings take us towards excess, when its justifiable, rational origins and underpinning are dislodged and thrust us towards a response beyond proportion, beyond reason, beyond justice, then vengeance loses its virtue and the cycle of hatred is set in motion. For by retaliating, we risk becoming what we hate. And so the challenge is to tame our unruly longings for revenge and to offer vengeance an acceptable and appropriate form, one that meets the needs of the wronged without harming its cause in doing so. How we direct vengeance, how we harness its energy, simultaneously resisting the pull of denial and compromise will ultimately mark its alignment with justice. In integrating the value in the pitfalls of the passion that is vengeance, we can look to mercy as the moderator and to law as the regulator. To mediate vengeance, to undermine its capacity for abuse, requires that we step into the lives of others, that they become human in our eyes, that we might afford those who trespass against us the mercy we would hope for ourselves. In his dissenting decision in a 1995 case on prisoners' rights to, pri to privacy, United States Court of Appeal judge Richard Posner wrote, there are different ways to look upon the inmates of prisons and jails in the United States. One way is to look upon them as members of a different species, indeed as a type of vermin, devoid of human dignity and entitled to no respect. It is wrongful to break the law, even when the lawbreaker is flawed, weak, retarded, unstable, ignorant, brutalized, or profoundly disadvantaged rather than violent, vicious, or evil to the core. But we should have a realistic conception of the composition of the prison and jail population before deciding that they are scum, entitled to nothing better than what a vengeful populace and a resource-staffed penal system chose to give them. We must not exaggerate the distance between us, the lawful ones, the respectable ones, and the prison and jail population. For such exaggeration will make it too easy for us to deny that population the rudiments of humane consideration. While mercy may at times, and in the right hands, moderate our tendencies to take vengeance to an eye for an eye extreme, bringing wisdom, maturity, and compassion 
play. There are those lawful and respectable citizens who would feel a greater comfort in vengeance being regulated by law. The law, they would argue, offers fairness, proportionality, certainty, predictability, and transparency. And more, but perhaps less visible, the law allows for a certain abdication of responsibility for exercising vengeful restraint. Rather than employing mercy from within, we look to the law to hand down just deserts. And so we disown vengeance, splitting this legitimate, powerful, constructive force from our soul and transforming its derided form for execution by the state. The British author of A Handbook on Hanging, Charles Duff, wrote in the early 1900s, man has not grown less cruel with the passage of that illusory thing called time, though in many parts of the world he's become a far greater hypocrite than he used to be. The act of murder, says the state, combined with an intention to kill or a reckless indifference to the outcome of the act, is a crime punishable by law. Judicial killing, the intentional act of murder by the state, in many countries, even of the civilizing world, is permitted under law. In his reflections on the guillotine, Albert Camus speaks to this incongruity. What he questions is capital punishment, if not the most premeditated of murders, to which no criminal act, no matter how calculated, can be compared. If there were to be real equivalence, the death penalty would have to be pronounced upon a criminal who had forewarned his victim of the very moment he would put him to a horrible death, and who from that time on had kept him confined at his own discretion for periods of months, even years. I grew up and initially practiced law in a country, adept at the taking of life, sanctioned by law and justified by racism. Apartheid South Africa boasted having the third highest rate of judicial executions in the world after China and the United States and Iran who jointly vied for second place. South Africa's death penalty figures were significantly bolstered one Friday morning in late May 1989 when the Honourable Mr Justice Young Basson sentenced 14 of my clients to hang by your neck until you are dead. One of South Africa's most prominent judges during the apartheid years, Mr. Justice Hookster, observed that it is only a stern sense of duty that impels a judge to pass a sentence of death. Many would have commended the judge who sent my clients to the gallows for displaying such a stern sense of duty, where he imposed 14 death sentences in less than 15 minutes, one May Friday morning. On one view, an exercise of duty, men somehow feeling themselves honored by the humiliation of their fellow beings. On another view, a mass premeditated judicial execution, vengeance cloaked in the robes of justice. The 14 condemned were part of a group of 25 black South Africans who became known as the Uppington 25 charged with and convicted of the murder of a black policeman during a riot in a conservative white enclave in the northwest of South Africa. During apartheid South Africa, a murder conviction carried a mandatory death sentence unless extenuating circumstances were proved to the court. 25 people were charged with the murder of one man. Of the 25, five were not initially arrested as suspects but pulled off the streets to be fill-ins at an identity parade, to make up the numbers at an identification parade. They were subsequently charged with and convicted of murder. The 25 were convicted of a murder by one judge and one assessor, South Africa having no jury system. Most of the 25 were not found to have physically participated in the killing of the policeman. However, all of them were found to have thrown stones 
at his house. An act, the judge concluded, sufficient to found an intention to kill. Mostly unemployed and unable to afford legal representation, the 25 were represented throughout the two years of the trial on conviction by one barrister, no solicitor, with limited resources in a case involving 150 witnesses and close to 15,000 pages of transcript. Soon after the, uh, the convictions, I was asked to act as solicitor for the 25 to prepare the case for extenuation and mitigation against the imposition of the death penalty. And a year and a half later, 14 of my clients were sentenced to death, including a couple in their late 60s with 10 children, impeccable parents, Gideon Madlongwani, a railway worker for 40 years, and Evelina de Brain, who worked as a domestic worker for white families most of her life, illiterate, arthritic, and suffering heart disease. To punish the clear perpetrators with appropriate terms of imprisonment was a requirement of justice. To take their lives in response meant its perversion. And the chaplain, he reads the final prayer. Be brave, my daughter, the Lord is waiting there. Oh, murder is so wrong, you see. Both the Bible and the court agree that the state's allowed to murder in the chair. Rather than condemn violence, the death penalty allows the state to repeat it. And a chorus of citizens can stand back from their collective desire for revenge and passively endorse its external enactment. The most irreversible recourse of the criminal law, the planned and calculated termination of life itself, the destruction of the greatest and most precious gift bestowed on humankind assumes a palatable veneer as we drape vengeance in the layers of the law. While we can hide behind a nation's law permitting capital punishment and denounce their cruel effect from the sidelines, we nonetheless become complicit observers in the judicial taking of life a systematically deliberate and planned act of execution sanctioned by the state as a mode of punishment and performed by an executioner remunerated for this purpose from public funds. Our tentative liberal adherence to the abolition of the death penalty and our ambivalence towards a crude embrace of vengeance is further played out when our citizens in Australia face the punishment of death on foreign shores. That we plead for clemency, albeit in limited ways and to no effect, for our own facing the death penalty in Changi prison bears no alignment with our apparent respect for the dictates of our sovereign island neighbours when they decree that the guilty will be shot through the heart by a firing squad. And we deny that our inarticulate bias against race, religion, and class, and the stature of the crime underlies our inconsistent stand. Our wavering stance at best, our hypocrisy at worst, was portrayed in a national poll at the time of Vietnamese Australian Van Nguyen's execution in Changi in Singapore in 2005. While only a minority, 27%, of Australians believed in the death penalty for murder, that figure was almost doubled to 52% who agreed that Van Nguyen's execution for drug smuggling was apt. In the courtroom, watch the balance of the scales. If the price is right, there's time for more appeals. The strings are pulled, the switch is stayed. The finest lawyer's fees are paid, and a rich man never dies upon the chair. The manner of state killing has also expanded our capacity for delusion and denial. John Stuart Mill declaring that those convicted of atrocious acts be blotted out from the fellowship of mankind and from the catalogue of the living, opposed the abolition of capital punishment 
by drawing in part on his unitarian, excuse me, utilitarian ideal. I defend this penalty, said Mill, on the very ground on which it's commonly attacked, on that of humanity to the criminal. As beyond comparison, the least cruel mode in which it is possible adequately to deter from the crime. What comparison, says Mill, can there really be in point of severity between consigning a man to the short pang of a rapid death and immuring him in a living tomb, there to linger out what may, long, what may be a long life to the hardest and most monotonous toil? The historical shift from a public spectacle to a sanitized killing resembling a clinical event, invoking the new technology of electric chair and lethal injection, has no doubt contributed to an illusion that execution by the state is but a short pang of rapid death. But for the prisoner on death row, however, each day brings tortuous reminders of impending death. The scales and neck measure to log the details of the living condemned to die. The soiled hoods and underwear for washing by inmates next in line. The wailing and the hymns pleading through the night. The foreboding footsteps and the turning of the keys. The lights never lowered. The delays, the stays the time extended from months to years, the date unknown, the agony of imminent execution. And then comes Mill's moment of apparent humanity to the criminal. When the executioner throws the switch that sends the current through the body, the prisoner cringes from torture. His flesh swells, his skin stretches to the point of breaking. He defecates, he urinates, his tongue swells, his eyes pop out. In some cases, the eyeballs rest on the cheeks of the condemned. His flesh is burned and smells of cooked meat. When the autopsy is performed, the liver is so hot, it cannot be touched by the human hand. After two years on death row and initially refused leave to appeal, all 14 of my clients facing death by hanging had their death sentences commuted by the highest court in the land. A South African newspaper at the time, the Sowetan, honed in on the fickle turns of justice and wrote, many people will no doubt be shocked that one judge can sentence people to death while another with the same exact evidence before him can set them free on suspended sentences. Men of the law will be able to produce many arguments explaining this astonishing phenomenon. For some men of the law, including American Supreme Court Judge Antonin Scalia, the reversal of an erroneous conviction on appeal demonstrates not the failure of the system, but its success. But exoneration of a condemned prisoner after spending years on death row is hardly indicative of a systemic triumph. Indeed, the death row phenomenon, the prolonged exposure to the brutal, dehumanizing period of swinging between the extremes of awaiting appeals and potential execution, has been recognized by international courts as amounting to the human rights violation of cruel and inhuman punishment. When former death penalty supporter and Republican governor of Illinois, George Ryan, commuted the death sentences of 167 death row inmates and pardoned four others in his final days of his term in January 2003, he said, our capital system is haunted by the demon of error. Error in determining guilt, error in determining who amongst the guilty deserves to die. The death penalty, he continued, is arbitrary and capricious and therefore immoral. I shall no longer tinker with the machinery of death. 
Evidently, a few days before his announcement, Governor Ryan had received word from Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa that to take a life when a life has been lost is revenge, not justice. Stop the murder, deter the crimes away. Only killing shows that killing doesn't pay. Yeah, that's the kind of law it takes, even though we make mistakes, sometimes send the wrong woman to the chair. Only killing shows killing doesn't pay. Stop the murder, deter the crimes away. It seems that the most enduring delusion we cling to in support of our contorted defense of sanctioned state killing is that capital punishment encourages potential murderers to avoid engaging in criminal homicide, that the death penalty has presumed value as a general deterrent. This presumption is often based on an intuitive but evidence deficient belief bolstered more very often by political appeal than penal merit. A sense of the obvious, an instinctive conviction that somehow legalized murder will deter the unlawful taking of life. Empirical studies and analysis undertaken by respected international criminologists and sociologists over decades offer conclusions which are, however, far more reliable that the deterrence hypothesis is a myth and that the death penalty does not add any significant deterrent effect above that of long-term imprisonment. In fact, in a recent study on the effect of the death penalty in Tobago and Trinidad, which boasts some of the highest per capita homicides in the world, American sociologists Greenberg and Agazzino, after analyzing crime statistics over a 50-year period, concluded that neither imprisonment nor death sentences nor executions had any significant relationship to homicides. Preventative detention or imprisonment may have its deterrent justifications, but preventative execution is another matter entirely. My opposition to the death penalty should give you no illusion about my response to the infliction of grave harm. That those who harm others are punished is an unremarkable requirement for a functioning society. The form their punishment takes, however, is the mark of a nation's evolution. It is my response to the destructive the destruction of the greatest and most precious gift bestowed on humankind in any form that urges my abhorrence of the death penalty and my scorn for the hypocrisy displayed by those who seek to mask its call and justify its retention. Their apparent rejection of the death penalty in country and parallel condemnation of its use offshore. Their justification of capital punishment for certain categories of crime and a denial that these might correspond with or reflect lies of abuse and humiliation, of poverty, political oppression or racial hatred. The unconvincing data on deterrence, yet their desperate attachment to its flawed rationale their moderation of an eye for an eye inside churches and temples, and their tacit support for violent revenge when sanctioned by law. A murder shared with many others, which is not only safe and permitted, but indeed recommended, is irresistible to the great majority of men. While our collusion with, with official vengeance may be irresistible to many, it is ultimately futile, contributing to two perhaps unintended but dangerous consequences. First, the execution of the death penalty risks compounding and protecting the grief of the victim's family, who speak of carrying a responsibility for and the burden of another's death which induces an excruciating return to their initial loss. 
They are victimized again, this time by the system that sought to give them justice. And finally, our adherence, no matter how ambivalent or veiled, to capital punishment perpetuates the absurdity of supposing that we can teach respect for life by ourselves denying it and destroying it. In condoning the deliberate annihilation of life at the highest level by the sovereign state, we endorse an example of barbarity for the governed, enabling a familiarity with the taking of life and an immunity to the lessening of its value, at once legitimizing, brutalizing, and desensitizing. And these are the damaging, hollow legacies of revenge. No matter the magnitude of a crime, we have a responsibility to live in the world to protect the worst and the weakest amongst us so that we can be secure that our rights will too be, protect be protected. My belief in law is that it be used to this end, to accomplish and not degrade justice, to license vengeance but curtail its excess. And so I end returning to the words of Camus and pray for us all that we may never victim nor executioner be.